Welcome, Susan and Nancy. Susan. <laughs> Susan and Mike. Um, I, I'll get to Susan and Nancy later. But um, this is uh, a picture that I took uh, in Florence, Arizona. I spent three days in a monastery, St. Anthony's Monastery. It was an Orthodox monastery. It was now the Orthodox say we haven't changed anything since 320 or 310, the Nicene Conference. So it's like stepping back, you know, almost 2,000 years when you were in that monastery. You saw the, exactly the same way that they they done forever. And Saint Anthony was the first monk. So my name's Anthony. And St. Anthony wrote a hundred rules for how to be a monk. And I'm a procedures guy myself, so I thought that was kind of neat. So uh, this is my father and me, 1941. And my father grew up in Liverpool, England. When he was two years old, he got tuberculosis and it went from his lung down to his ankle. And the doctors told my grandfather, we're gonna to have to amputate. So my grandfather said, I'm not gonna have a cripple in the family and put him in a TB sanitarium at the age of two. Now, my father was in there until he was four they did do operations on his ankle and left him with a shorter, shorter foot. But luckily he had orthopedic shoes made way back in those days. It must've been kind of not innovative, but he was able to get around quite well. Uh, he was raised by his grandparents never saw his father, but when he was 10 years old, he did. And his father said, Jim, I'm busy right now. Meet me at this restaurant. So my father went to the restaurant and he never met his father again. But anyway, he uh, went to see, I mean, he ran away from home went to see when he was 16, was a cabin boy, became a chief purser, fairly popular amongst the wealthy passengers. And he jumped ship in New York City. They said, if you get into New York City, we'll hire you. So he worked in New York City and worked in uh, Newport, Rhode Island as well, in the, the very elite of society at that time. But he was the, the man who polished the shoes, so to speak. Um, he, during the war, he couldn't go to the war because of his foot. So he managed a Pepsi-Cola plant during the war. And we had an idyllic life, I think, during the war. And uh, he worked very hard. He, was, he had to fix all the equipment. You know, there were just a bunch of old men in the, in the factory there. Well, this is a picture from 1944, I'm four years old, I'm sitting in my grandfather's lap, that is Harvey Shoemaker, his wife Viola, and Harvey was, well I guess I ought to go through the people, there's from left to right the children, there's me, four, my sister Nancy, one, and my sister Susan, three. The, the um, we all became programmers. I think that's kind of interesting thing. Programming was a new profession when we were coming out of college. So we were on the leading edge. My sister Susan went into the Peace Corps. When she came out of the Peace Corps, she went into the programming profession. And she was at Harvard working on state of the art thing, the operating system of the future, Multics. And you can still see pictures of her on the internet. So she was a real innovator. Uh, 
Well, this is the first church I attended. I'm sure I attended that from the third grade through the fifth grade. This is in Springfield, New Jersey. And it was just three blocks from my house. And you see the soldier there on the, the left-hand corner? Mm -hmm. uh, this was the site of the Springfield uh, battle, which was the last battle in New Jersey with the, with the uh, British in, in 1780. This is a picture showing the chaplain of the Continental Army coming out of the church with a bunch of, bi a bunch of hymnals, the Watts hymnal. And he's telling the soldiers, give them Watts, boys. The soldiers had run out of wadding for the guns, so they need paper to keep the gunpowder in before they put the bullet in. You can see, the, you can see on this one soldier reloading his gun there. So he's put the gunpowder in, then the wadding, then the shell. Well, a favorite book of mine was Robinson Crusoe. He was um, shipwrecked out on a Pacific island and totally isolated. He had to recreate his own world. Now, it turned out on another side of the island, which he couldn't reach, there were other there were wild people over there. But eventually, on a Friday, he, he meets. Friday! So Friday uh, was incredibly useful to him. He did everything for him. It was he was his servant. So he, uh, from the, his name, we got Girl Friday and Man Friday in our, in our lexicon. Have you heard that or not? Yes. Okay, well, that's where it comes from. Yeah. Well, I also was a big fan of uh, Ben Franklin. I read his book, the autobiography of Ben Franklin when he was 12. And Ben Franklin wrote it for his son when his son was 12 years old. And in it, he discussed virtues, um, um, industry, uh, integrity, patriotism, and leadership. He was, it was a guide for young people. And it used to be the number one bestseller in the world after the Bible. Very popular in Germany and very popular in the United States. All students needed to read it back in like 1890. Tesla. Yes, Tesla. Love no. him. Nikola Tesla. Right. That's well, my I, hero. I, was, I really wasn't that fascinated with Tesla at the time, but uh, only in later times have I read about him. But my friend made a Tesla coil. And I made a Van de Graaff generator. So we could make four inch sparks. We wanted to see who could make the biggest spark. I was led to all kinds of projects. You uh, made that? That's yours? That, that's, that's a kit. I made one from scratch. I, I used, for the, the top thing, I used two colanders, aluminum colanders that I taped together and I bent the bottom of the colander in so there wouldn't be any rough edges. And I got some vinyl stuff that you would use on a on a furniture, yeah. and made the belt and made plastic. I actually got you know, instructions from you know, Frankenstein movies. I, I, it's fine. Yeah. Um, I, I got the instructions out of Boy's Life on how to do it, but um, I had many other projects: uh, rockets and bombs and uh, various experiments. Actually, my father probably saved my life in one thing. I was making this fort that's got to be about seven feet deep. This is just nine-year-olds. So we'd lower the rope down, I'd fill the bucket up, they'd pull the bucket up and built this big fort and put logs over it and boards and covered it up. It's a secret fort, right? So then I wanted to put a side entrance in at the bottom so I was going through a tunnel horizontally. And luckily, my father came and he got the other fathers to, to bury it in because that was an incredible death trap, you know. So uh, that was, he saved my life, I guess. So this was my high school graduation picture. 
I just had to circle the inventor thing, so I was always lost in the inventor. Well, I go off to NC State, think and do, and I wound up at NC State because my grandfather's brother had a summer job on the railroad and got injured, and the railroad gave him money to go to college. And as he got to be the dean of the School of Architecture at NC State. So that's why I wound up at NC State, because we had relatives there. Well, I was not a good student, and I uh, asked my mother and father to take off and do a student internship at the White Sands Missile Range. So this was my spring semester of my sophomore year. I was out at the White Sands Missile Range. And I had a very boring job on a monitoring station. And it was, wasn't doing me any good. And it was, I don't like the clerical work, I guess. But my friends were programming. So I went and got a job programming. And the lady said, well, you gotta ask permission to transfer, but I'd like to have you. So I asked my boss, and he said, well, you gotta ask the branch manager. Ask the branch manager. He said, you gotta ask the division manager. Ask the division manager, said, no, we need you over on the monitoring station. I quit. The last day, of my job, I bring my suitcase to work because I was at New Mexico State and there was a bus that would take us into, the, into uh, Los Alamos, my, um, White Sands. And then there was a, they also had a bus that would take you to, uh, down to Texas, to El Paso. So the last day I was headed to El Paso Anyway, the colonel, I saw, talked to the colonel, and he said, why didn't you come and talk to me? You know, I'd already been up three levels. And the colonel says, uh, anyway, but I had already checked out. So I go back home, and I go back to NC State, and this pretty much was me as a student, always daydreaming. So I decided that I had to change my ways. I wanted to get out of college as fast as possible. I was not going to repeat English another time. So I decided to sit on the front row, take notes, try to figure out what the teacher's saying. And this was actually one of the most important life lessons. What are, what are they trying to communicate with me? Uh, instead of just listening, just try to psych them out. Because if they're probably emphasizing the stuff that's going to be on the exam. You know, they probably are. Anyway, my grades went way up. Now, I just have to say that I love this Grammarly software. I use it all the time, so I just would recommend it. Especially if you're, if you're learning in a foreign language, right? This is, this is an incredible tool. Well, I go back to NC State, and they now have a computer there. This was it, the 650. It really was not quite in the computer. It could read cards and punch cards and had a primitive computer. But I taught myself how to program that. I mean, I went and bought a manual and uh, spent the whole weekend on it, Friday to Sunday, and I figured I'd... I'd Taking the course, I went to the computing center. I couldn't get a job. I, every semester I went there and no job. So anyway, I wound up working at the post office, throwing mail, which actually paid a very good salary, especially when you're in the South, where the salary levels were low, and this was a national salary. Well, I get to graduate school, and this was uh, Dr. Doggett, who was, really was an incredible, incredibly inspiring guy. And he helped me get through my master's degree. And he had one statement for me. He said, uh, tell me, you know, I, my wife is 
Catholic. And I grew up Methodist. But for the sake of the kids, I joined the Catholic Church so we could be together. So that the, he said that was really important to have the, the family together in whatever church they went to. Well, finished. Um, well, when I started out my master's degree, they were soliciting people for their new pro, new computer. So I got an assistantship programming for this 1410 computer. It was called a business computer. And they wanted me to write analysis of variance program. And there were two other people with me, but after about two weeks or three weeks, they quit because we didn't have a computer. The computer was coming in March. This is September, so six months. And all we had was a set of instructions. We had to write the program. Well, I went and talked to people in the statistics department who calculated this stuff. And I followed Dr. Grandish who had some, had written programs for the 650. And Dr. Grandish says he wasn't gonna learn a new computer. They're changing things all the time. So anyway, I uh, started working on that. I actually wrote a language to describe the analysis of variance model. So my first program had a, a language in it to control it. The, the um, a after I uh, completed my master's degree, I went to work at the Pentagon and we were gonna put all the military information into the computer. I mean, that, what an awesome goal. This is what they told me. And I actually uh, worked for our work, contributed to the, the National Military Command Center. You got the Joint Chiefs of Staff at the top, and then you've got the Army, Navy, Air Force underneath. So this was at the Joint Chiefs of Staff level, the National Military Command Support Center. Well, this is a war room here, and you see all these sergeants here control what's on the screens. Uh, when they're actually uh, in a crisis, they have colonels down there manning the phones. And up, you can't see it exactly, but those windows up there, behind that, the generals would have their, where they would be looking at all the screens. So this was the war room at, at the Pentagon at the time I was there. Well, after two years, I got invited to come back to NC State to rewrite the analysis variance program, the regression program. And I had already been planning or thinking about how I could take the things I learned at the Pentagon, the self-defining file, and combine it with the st statistical procedures and have an incredible system. So, I jumped in it real quickly. This is the, the computer. This is actually a modern day computer, at least the architecture is still being used by banks. This is the massive um, uh, enterprise computer that's used to run our government. Uh, it's an, um, was an incredible step forward. Well, I named it Statistical Analysis System, and this was a sign we put up on our suite. In 71, we had our first manual called this. And I, I actually designed this manual, and it was, well, actually, I don't know if you're about designing it. I ripped off the Scandinavian Airlines logo and got a, something from the Triangle University news, newsletter thing. Anyway, put that together. But uh, then in 68, this fellow, Sandy Mullen, uh, came to me and said that the furniture manufacturers had this problem cutting lumber. And the issue is to cut the boards into dimension parts and, and waste the fewest amount of lumber doing, them, doing that. And this is the machine 
that uh, we created. 16 foot long board, 16 inches wide. And it would have to race down, scan it, and in 40 seconds compute and mark the board. So that was a challenge to do this thing. And Sandy Mullen and I formed a company, Bar Mullen Incorporated. There's Sandy with his son. I only stayed with the company for two years, but we were selling our little um, simple-minded, uh, they called it back gauge computer program. We sold it all over the world, but I, I didn't have any interest in, in that because I was working bigger fish. The SAS thing was a much bigger, bigger thing in my mind. So this was um, 1974, and this was the first time we really had things completely together. And it was an incredible piece of software because we had the general linear models, which um, nobody else in the world had, and that's what's used for doing medicine and agricultural experiments. It's incredibly important. Uh, we even had a Russian uh, contact us and wanted a copy of it. We sent it to Russia. I visited him about 10 years ago. He said that he got data from all over Russia. And his wife was his programmer and he did the analysis, did the reports. People needed, needed his expertise all over Russia because he had the software. So it was quite uh, a resource for him. 1976, uh, we came out with this uh, fairly elegant manual. I did the cover of this one. I came up with the logo, the red, white, and blue, the, uh, this system was, Incredibly easy to install, incredibly efficient, could handle massive amounts of data. Uh, people could do, who were doing analytical work, could do the complete job with inside the system without having to use other software. So it's a complete package for most researchers. Well, we went across the street, and this was our first office there. So we probably had 20 people over here in the next couple of years. And there's me in 76 at a user's conference in Orlando. My hair was a little bit longer then. <laughs> well, I left uh, SAS Institute in 79. I decided I would make this machine come to life. So I rented a warehouse, I got conveyors, and I got a, a, a big big computer and started working on the programming and uh, figuring out how to do a scanner. I hired engineers. The only problem was <laughs> that I used $150,000 in one year. And I only had $340,000 from leaving the SAS, so I knew I couldn't sustain this. So I decided, well, I'm gonna build some software. I'm gonna call it Friday for Man's Servant. So uh, I, you know, when you have some kind of aspiration, which is just to do the ultimate language, what does that mean? And actually, I didn't know what it meant. But finally I started saying, well, I got to the library and study what Bertrand Russell did, what Chomsky said about language. And I finally got my bearings with a self-defining system. And I built this self-defining system. And it starts off with the grammar of grammar. And the grammar of grammar defines the grammar of language X. This is a, you had software that was controlled by an editor that was controlled by a grammar. So the grammar, you 
using the grammar, you could enter statements in a language. So you start off with the grammar of grammar to find the grammar of language X. When you have the grammar of language, when you step into the grammar of language X, it'll define an object in language X. And the grammar of grammar was a grammar so it defined itself. So I'd achieve self-definition. This, in my mind, this is the truth. A system that is completely true to itself, because yeah. every definition resides inside the system, and it's true to its definitions. So anyway, this was uh, a very exciting thing for me, and I actually brought this thing to life. And I got 10 of my friends and gave a presentation in the office, and I, um, well, this is just to tell you about self-definition. This is a sculpture that's down in Winter Park by Albion. And uh, it's man carving his own destiny. So he was a Czech sculpture. He did this when he was like 20 years old. He's carving his own future. But every cell is a self-defining root. It's all defined by genes. Now, in the Bible, it starts off in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So, essentially, it's all language. You know, this is a language, right? So, God created this language that started evolution. So, it is according to the Bible, is the point of this statement. At least the people who wrote the Bible were wise to realize that language is the heart of everything. And then Moses asks God, who are you? And God replies, I am that I am. Self-definition again. And you go to Shakespeare, to thy own self be true. So uh, my mind has been captured by this thought. Uh, well, I guess I should, should dwell a little bit more on this. I thought to myself, if I'm going to see the truth, I better be truthful. Now this is, can be an exercise to only say true statements, absolute true statements. And I would, well, after we visited with, let's say, some car repair guy, I would explain to my son, well, he said this and this and this. But I think this is, there's some conflicts there. So I would explain how I didn't think it was exactly true, what he said, but you know, it's the way the, way the world works, actually. So, um, I was very much into talking about the truth back in this time. So my wife says to me, you're so crazy, I'm gonna take the kids down to Gainesville. So I'm up in Raleigh by myself. I went to the grocery store and I bumped into Mrs. Kojima. And Mrs. Kojima is a, from Japan. She's a widow that lives on the next street from where I live. And uh, I, her husband used to be like a big shot in quantitative genetics. Genetics, he died as a young man. Anyway, I say to Mrs. Kojima, I said, hey, can we go to lunch and talk about linguistics? That was my thing. And she says, well, Tony, if your wife wouldn't mind, sure. And I said, well, I'm sure she wouldn't mind. And I'm thinking to myself, well, this is the first time I've said something I'm not absolutely sure of. You know, I wasn't, wasn't absolutely truthful with what I said. So now, this might have been a small thing, but it wasn't for me. It would sent me into like a depression. So I, um, thought about it, I said, you know, I need a higher authority. 
So I started going to church, took the family to church, and so that was my time, and I went back to church because of that thing. Well, I get four years without an income. That's scary, right? So I decide, well, I'm gonna do something that's a sure thing. I had taught myself, or I had actually gone up, gone up to a five-day course on how to do digital electronics. And I said, well, I can do a communications board for the IBM PC, and I could do this software which enabled to drive a high-speed printer off a little PC. So you don't need a mainframe to, to do remote printing. So I started this company, and uh, 10 years later, we're making a million dollars a month. It's incredible. And this is, this is our, our people here. And I'm down there rolling this thing back at the bottom. Uh, and I guess to, to, to the left-hand side, there's the fellow handling the uh, bus and tag connector. And that's Ken Clark. He was kind of a genius. He was a nuclear engineering major like myself, actually. But he did an incredible piece of software. I mean, it was actually hardware. We got this chip that you could program. So you didn't have to do I mean, your own circuit. You could just program this chip. And it would run like a, a circuit. Anyway, we did this channel board and we were replacing mainframe computers with something we were selling for seven thousand dollars the mainframe computers costing three thousand a month we did it at tiger hall so the payback when they when they got a pc plus our about eight thousand dollar product was three months to pay back that, that so we were incredibly uh, successful all over the world, and then we built this built this building, and that's the front of it. Well, I actually was not that interested in 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 that. Uh, I actually used this picture to say I was interested in understanding the world. So I. Uh, sold the majority of that company to a man who worked for me and I was going to the first thing I was going to do was build an enterprise model a essentially a philosophy how to run any company that was complete it was a procedure oriented but it had it started off with values and the purpose and you drilled down to smaller and smaller things. Everything had a per higher purpose that led up to the ultimate purpose, which was the good. So I used to work on that, and uh, I ran out of money on that too. But I thought, no, it was no big deal. You just go to a bank. I had $6 million worth of uh, collateral. The bank says, no, because of Dodd-Frank, we can't do it. I'd loan you the money, but the Dodd-Frank says I can't do it. So anyway, I jumped out of that said, I'm going to build a model of reality and make it where everybody can understand programming and you can navigate through knowledge space. A 12-year-old would be able to understand the big databases. So that has been my quest. So along the way, I... Uh, get fascinated with this fellow Gödel, who was a mathematician of the 1900s, the most famous mathematician. And this shows Gödel and Einstein, they were best buddies at Princeton. And after Einstein died, Gödel and his fellow um, Ho Wang got to be best buddies. Ho Wang came from China, 1946. He was a mathematician, logician, and a writer. Now, uh, Gödel got to be famous 
for something he did when he was 22 years old in Austria. And that was to prove that no system can be consistent and complete if defined by syntax. And I completely believe that. But now I'm building a system to defined by structure. So you get data structures to define other data structures. So there's no syntax. You always have one finger in the concept and one finger in the object. And you could descend into littler, littler objects or back into the biggest, biggest object. All starts off with the concept of a concept. Self-definition again. The concept of a concept defines a concept and it defines itself. Well, I'm obsessed with this thing. Well, this is kind of a cute thing that just happened to me two weeks ago. Uh, Steve Blay on the left, uh, he is a fellow who worked for me and was the hardest working guy I had. I mean, he was working 80 hours a week for years. Of course, I paid him time and a half for his overtime, so he's making two and a half times his, what everybody else is making, right? But anyway, he got burned out, he became a drummer, and then he, uh, after he finished his drumming thing, he got into this idea that uh, in, in nursing homes, there are many patients there, have nobody come to visit them. So they completely cut off from the outside world. So he said, we need to get young people in there the nursing home. So he's got friends across the ages. It's quite an active group in, in Gainesville. Maybe it's down in Ocala. And uh, he's, he spent like a year on Friends Across the Ages. And now he just is a sort of the father figure. It runs itself. Uh, but uh, he's in the hospital visiting Two of the people from his nursing home. And one is Olga's patient. Oh my God. Isn't it amazing? So, the point is, the point of this is, there are these living saints right in our community. And I think it's important to, important to realize, why are these, these saints? It is Christianity. And here's a picture of my son, Alexei, with Ben Carson. This is up when he was in high school in, uh, in Gainesville, Georgia. And uh, Ben Carson uh, grew up in uh, a slum in Baltimore, became a medical doctor, did important uh, research, uh, important heart transplant breakthrough heart transplant uh, research. He now lives with the Department of uh, um, Housing, and he's really working very hard to solve the, some, what he can of the homeless problem. Then we have uh, President Fox. You know, he's got a master's degree in theology. So he, he wanted to be a minister once, once upon a time. So there are these, these uh, saints around us. So, uh, uh, that's pretty much the end of my talk. I think I had something up, oh no, no. Oh no, I, I just wanna say I do have a YouTube channel and you can see more things on my YouTube channel. So thank you. Thank you, Tony. Oh, thank you, Elsie Thank you for sharing your life with us. Okay, well, yeah. I guess I ought to turn this off. I can easily. I'm sorry I spoke during the facts in my No, 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 no. We, <laughs> it shows that we have a live audience here.